It's been a tough couple of weeks for me. It's been a tough couple of weeks for us. Last Sunday, I was supposed to do a reflection on gratitude because we're running a campaign with other Obama leaders on mental health. And it was the same Sunday, a week after George Floyd had been killed in Minneapolis. And I couldn't bring myself to do a reflection video of what I'm grateful for because all I could think about is what's there to be grateful for. And the only thing that I could really see that I was grateful for is just to be alive and alive young black men. And this got me thinking and, and, and conversing with you know, my friends from different backgrounds, races and ethnicities. And here are a couple of thoughts that have come out of these conversations. I was talking to one of my, one of my friends and we were trying to dissect where you know, this racial injustice comes from. Why do these cops feel the need or the power to take someone else's life just because of the color of their skin? Why do they feel threatened? Why do they feel afraid? And after much conversation, we came to the conclusion that racism, as Angela Davis puts it, is not our problem. It's not a black person's problem. It's not the victim's problem. Racism has to do with the sick perpetrator. That's the person who is ill with this racism demon. And, but not only that, the reason why you know, so many racist uh, or white people are afraid of black people or have this ang angst or anxiety or, or fear when it comes to young black men or just black people in general, it's not because black men are scary, but it is because when they see us, they see themselves. And let me break this down for you. You see, when you're dating, when you are cheating with people who are dating, right? You're cheating with someone's girlfriend. And this keeps going on. Uh, you see them post happy uh, on Instagram and on Facebook. But you know what's going on behind the scenes. And then one day, you decide to have a girlfriend. You find a nice, disciplined young lady who's amazing in all facets. But what starts happening is you start seeing yourself in her. You start seeing her using the same messed up lenses that you've been using. So you become paranoid. You become paranoid of what they could be doing. And yet, they might not be doing anything. So in many ways, when racist white people see us as a threat, see us as people to be gunned down or fear, of fear of us, it's not because we're fearful, it's not because we're scary, but it is because they see themselves in us and they are scared of the replications of that. And what does this mean? It means that when you actually, this is justified because when you actually look at the white supremacy manifestos, a huge deal of them talk about this idea that if we don't keep controlling or take over, we are going to be the slaves of black people. They are going to take over. So for hundreds and hundreds of years, every white person knows the injustices that has happened against the black men. And when an, injust hap when an injustice happens, there's normally a protocol that's observed where justice has to be served. And when justice is served, what happens is uh, there's repercussions that come with that justice. So when white people see us and they look at the legacy of apartheid, the legacy of slavery, Jim Crow, and all these things that have happened, they see the amount of injustice that has happened and they are scared that the day they stop this injustice, we're going to do the same thing to them. And that's the problem. And that's where this fear comes from. But I want to assure them uh, that we're not asking for revenge. We're asking for justice. 
And I think this is where we can take a, a page out of South Africa's book, where, you know, South Africa is, is far from being perfect, but there's a couple of things that I think we could learn from them. At the end of apartheid, South Africa came together as a country and had something called a peace and reconciliation uh, settings, where conversations were had about what happened in apartheid, confessions were made, uh, certain people were given, you know, to serve uh, in jail, whilst others, there were a certain level of pardons, and there were systems that were set in place uh, from then onwards uh, as a form of reparations for all the injustices that had happened. And uh, was that enough? No. We're still trying to figure it out as a country. But what it did was it set precedent uh, for the whole country to acknowledge and realize the original sin of colonization and apartheid that had happened at that time. So whether you're talking to a 12-year-old South African or you're talking to a 27 or 60-year-old, they know about apartheid. They know what happened. They know it was unjust. And they know that the country is continually trying to figure out how to fix those systemic problems that have happened. And that, in some way, is a form of reparations. From the b black economic empowerment to um, certain land redistributions and, and a continuing conversation that happened today. But what America hasn't done is they have not acknowledged the original sin of slavery, of Jim Crow. Um, and, 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 and all of this has compounded to this point. When we see police killing people, when we see people being racist, those are just the symptoms of the roots of having not acknowledged this original sin. So the only way to mentally deal with it as humans is for them to continue this systemic oppression of black people. Because the longer it continues, the more you don't have to face it. The more you don't have to acknowledge it. And because, why, why are they scared to acknowledge it so much? Why are they scared to acknowledge it so much? Because when you acknowledge the, the inhumanity and the gravity and the problems and the issues brought about by slavery, then you need justice. And with justice comes reparations. And the problem is a lot of folks think that those reparations is us doing to them what they did to us. But as, South, as we've learned in South Africa, that's not the case. And I think it's important for us to push for that, for the acknowledgement of the original sin for the re-looking at a constitution that was written by forefathers who in one aspect were great because they had protested and fought against you know, oppression from the British and yet went on to oppress other people in America who were racist, who were sexist. And even though a lot of these laws have been amended, uh, what's also happened is that there's been amendments to those amendments. Like, uh, for example, when you look at, uh, you know, no one should be slaves. Uh, and yet, there's an amendment that unless, if they are in prison, then they are property of the state. So there's, there's a lot of these things built into these laws which are systemic injustices. And I think it is time for America to come together, have peace and reconciliation, rewrite a new constitution, learning from the mistakes of the former constitution and learning from the successes of the former constitution to create uh, a free, uh, a fair, uh, an equitable, uh, livable world uh, for everyone. And yes, you cannot always change hearts, but you can change laws and you can give people a chance to live a dignified, intrinsically valuable life that they deserve in a country that they fought for, in a country that they've built, and in a country that's their home. Thank you.